from 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. It says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I thought that was very fitting for Jonas. The time has come for my departure. The verse continues to say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Our service today is in loving memory of Jonas Creed Shuffle, whom the Lord gave to us on January 18th, the year 1932, and he took to himself on April 8th, the year 2024. We come today for a number of reasons. First, we come to remember the ways in which Jonas touched our lives here on earth. There'll be a number of people that we'll be sharing. Perhaps you have a brief story that you would like to share too. A time in the service will come, uh, uh, we'll have an opportunity for that in the service. We come today also to offer our sympathy to those who are in sorrow. But most of all, we come to seek the word of God and what the word of God says to us during this time. Because it will offer us comfort and strength as it did for Jonas. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather today. Thank you that as we gather, we are not gathering with no hope, but we gather with great hope, the hope that we know that is found in Jesus, the hope that Jonas believed in, and because of that hope and belief in Jesus, Lord, we are thankful that as we gather today, we know that Jonas is not here, but he is in your presence. Lord, thank you for that truth. Thank you for that promise. Lord, I pray that as we celebrate his life today, that will be the theme, the theme of his life lived, well lived, uh, with Jesus, now in Jesus' presence. Bless this time that we'll share together in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together uh, the hymn, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. The words should be on the screen. want to follow with me in your scriptures, I'll be reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18.
God's word says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And then reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm actually going to start at verse 50 because it's kind of the prelude of the sentence. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. At this time, we're going to have a time for sharing. And I'm going to ask that if you are going to say anything and share anything, stories or uh, incidents or anything regarding your interaction with Jonas, please come over here to this microphone. Uh, you might think, well, I don't need a microphone. I've got loud enough voice. Well, we're streaming it. And if you're there and people are at home trying to listen, they won't hear a word you say. So please, if, you, uh, if you're going to share anything, please come over to this microphone. Thank you. Uh, grandchildren and families who can't be here, we wish they were. I'm Lois. Dad is named after his grandpa, Jonas B. Miller. And his middle name, Creed, comes from uh, Dr. Creed Glass, who delivered him at birth. Dad have, had a very personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That allowed him to thank the Lord for giving us a purpose and meaning in life. And he said that often in his prayers. He also thanked the Lord for the power of the Holy Spirit living within him, asking the Holy Spirit to guide and direct all of us. God's word is true. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope, or hope and a future. Another way to say it could be, um, no, wait. I have it all planned out, plans to take care of you, not abandon you, plans to give you the future you hope for. God's plans for dad were clear. He firmly stood on God's promises in every area of his life as standing on the promises was played in the prelude. As a window company advertises, 
we not only stand behind our windows, but we stand on them. And that's what we each need to do, is stand on the promises of God, because they're for eternity. They're for now and, and eternity. Um, God taught us to stand on God's promises no matter what the situation. Dad had much determination and a strong con constitution and a very strong hand grip if you ever shook his hands. Um, he, let's see here. He willingly did whatever he needed done wherever it was. Often he would say, get her done. I'm sure the boys especially, <laughs> we've all heard that. And the grand, some grandkids, too. Um, Mom and Dad had, had many picnics and family reunions, and this is still done today. When Mom was in her last days here on earth, Dad prayed, thanking the Lord for her being his precious wife and the mother of his children. They respected each other and asked, I, I mean, worked closely on the farms where we lived. He was a man of few words, so when he spoke, they were important. Dad often said, yes, the Lord has truly blessed us. You may have seen the payday that Dad had in his hand in the casket. That was from a local company that he would go to frequently, he even mentioned it. Um, his last few days when he was in the hospital bed. Several different locations that he would talk about. And he, um, but the payday he's getting now is beyond what we can imagine because heaven and hell both are very detailedly described in scripture. Um, and it's so neat because we can know now where we will spend eternity. We need to decide during our life on earth when we make the decision. Uh, let's see here. On March the 30th, when Dad had the stroke, he asked, Ken and I were there because Ken helped me, put him in the chair. How are you children going to do without, uh, after Mom and I aren't here, if we're, when we're both gone? And Ken said, first, you showed us how to love and serve the Lord. You showed us how to love and get along with each other. God's plan for our family continues. There's um, today. As siblings, we are all involved in serving the Lord in various ways. And then, as far as the business, like since we have a family-owned and operated business, Chef Incorporated, it has allowed the, someone from the store to come and help on a moment's notice to, to give care to Dad. And it was a privilege to be able to do that also. Um, and several evenings, the family would sing together, sometimes two to three hours. Dad was in the hospital bed, and we would sing hymns and pray together. And it was just so neat because sometimes he had a grin on his face, and, but he didn't speak for about four or five days, I think it was, verbally. But he, we knew he heard us. Um, but he was really resting peacefully, and it was just so... Th Great to have everyone pitching in to help the 24-7 care we provided for him. Um, and Dad is now seen in heaven. And thanks for being here. So, thank you. Well, I'm going to share some of the memories I have of Dad. Um, Dad was a man who taught by example. He was the one who taught us how important our relationship with Jesus was. He showed us how to love mom. He showed us how to love our spouses. It was not unusual at all, and I, it was a fond memory of mine. Dad would come in from the barn, or before he would go to the barn, he would stand there at the kitchen sink and give mom a hug and a kiss and tell her he loved him. And I think so many times our kids don't see that affection between their parents, and they need to have that reassurance. And it was always so reassuring to me to know how much mom and dad loved each other and they respected each other. I never heard either one of them say anything bad about the other one. I never saw either one of them raise a voice to the other one and that just meant so much. I remember sitting um, around the kitchen table when breakfast 
when we had breakfast, we always did devotions. And up until that picture that's on the front of the bulletin, Lorraine took out like two weeks ago. That was dad. For breakfast, he was sitting there doing his devotions. And he was always very faithful at leading the devotions with his kids there. It was always very important that we were in church. If the doors were open, be it Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, we were at church if the doors were open. And if you were not there, you better be pretty sick <laughs> because that was not allowed. <laughs> he prayed with us. He taught us how to pray, and he taught us how to sing. He and Mom both taught us how to sing. And I think we were talking about that. Maybe that's part of the reason they taught us to sing harmony was because we used to drive to Myersdale when we were little to church. Maybe that was to keep us kids from fighting. I don't know, but it was, we always were singing in the car. He always called mom hun. That was his, his term of endearment from mom was hun. And whenever he was ready to go somewhere, it was always, well, hun, are you ready to go? So we had discussed at, at the table, when dad's ready to go, we're going to get a text that says, well, hun. We knew he was ready to go. Growing up on the farm, I remember being little and just getting the one-on-one -on -one time to go out with dad and ride on the tractor if he was plowing a field or whatever. I especially remember the, the one farm had a hill up behind it and just sitting on the fender and I'm thinking, I don't know if I'd ever let my kid do that today because that was so dangerous, but we did it. I also enjoyed the times that we had when Nelson was in the hospital the first time, I got to spend some extra time with Dad in the milking parlor because Nelson used to help Dad milk and Dad would be feeding the cows. And I just enjoyed that time, just one-on-one -on -one time again with Dad, just getting to spend time with him talking just about life in general. Sundays were always a good day for a nap. They still are. <laughs> or occasionally we got to go for a Sunday drive, and that was always pretty special to do that too. If the kids got out of line, he had a look. And you knew not to, to uh, step too far out of line when he gave you that look. But I, I don't remember ever getting spanked as a child. We were discussing this the other day. Den does. <laughs> um, apparently, Den got a pretty good whooping one day. But I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> and there were some fun things that happened. Or Dad could have got really upset, and he did not. Um, growing up, we didn't have too many opportunities that we got to go buy a birthday cake for dad. Dad's birthday was January 18th and <laughs> Dan and I went to Lloyd's Bakery to pick up a cake for dad. And we were coming up the road and at the farm, the driveway looped around the house. The roads were icy and Dan was driving and I'm holding the cake. And right as we got past to turn into the second driveway, Nelson backed the tractor out of the shop right in front of us and we hit the rear wheel of the tractor, took the front end of the car off, and I'm holding a birthday cake. It is lopsided and says, happy birthday, duh. <laughs> I don't remember him getting upset about that. You know, he was very, very mellow and very, very even keeled, and I have always loved that about him. Let's see what else. Working with Dad. Dad was, only had an eighth grade education. And I've always been so impressed of how smart he was. He was smarter and wiser than so many people I know that have college educations. And what he did on an eighth grade education just has always just amazed me. From farming to driving truck, he used to drive truck into New York City and whole, haul poultry. I think he went to Philadelphia, I'm not sure where all he went. To he had a butcher shop with his dad for years, to farming, and then opening the dealership where we all had, had the privilege to work with him. There were a lot of fun times, too, at the business. Um, it was interesting sometimes. We had a call one day. Dad went to deliver a corn planter. And um, <laughs> we get a phone call about 10 minutes after he leaves and said, whoever is delivering the corn planter, the marker arm fell down, and he's taken out mailboxes all along 601. <laughs> so Dan and Ken go down to sea, and they find a path of destruction, and from... The shop, clear over to about where A.J. Walker's are, every mailbox is, ma and there's mail all over the, mail, all over the road. <laughs> we got to hold him on the phone. He pulled off and uh, put the marker arm back up. But that was one of the fun times with him. They spent the day picking everybody's mail up and putting new mailboxes up for everybody that day. And then the next year, the John Deere calendar was on mailboxes. I, we think that was an honor for Dad. <laughs> We had a morning, too. I was there putting parts away one morning, and we had a phone call from Dad, and he says, Loretta, we had a little accident over here. He had left two 
deliver a skid steer down over the mountain. So Den came in and I said, Dad had a little accident. Why don't you go see what's going on? So Den hops in the truck and goes over by the landfill. And the little accident was a, our new rollback that was now totaled. The skid steer is totaled and the truck is laying on the side. The skid steer is snapped off and Dad crawled out the side window. But he had a little, we had a little accident. We've never figured out. <laughs> Maybe it was Jesus and him. We always thought he had a mouse in his pocket. We don't know. <laughs> but if anything happened, it was always we. It was never I. He was very faithful at King's for breakfast when we still had the business. He would go in there and meet with some of the other local. He always saw a lot of local people, and he would get the, the local news there for breakfast. And we knew if he was going for a bite with Mom, he was going to King's. If he was going to go grab a sandwich, they were going to McDonald's. We learned his language. He was always busy, busy, busy. Things were fancy, fancy, fancy. Kyle said he probably got to heaven and said, Jesus, these streets don't need to be all fancy, fancy, fancy. <laughs> he liked tasty, tasty. If you got a three tasty, it was really good. If it's, what did you call this? We knew not to make it for him again. And he loved his cold stuff. He loved his apple pie and he loved payday candy bars, but we have a lot of fond memories of him and we'll always cherish those. So it's not goodbyes until we see you again. Legacy. A legacy is the sum of one's personal values. What did Grandpa value more than anything? His relationship with Jesus. Who knew that? Who knew life? Who knew in his life? Who in his life knew that Grandpa valued most? Anyone that knew him? Of course. How about anyone who talked to him? The farmers next door, the wait staff at King's, the mechanic at the shop, the cashier at the grocery store. He was not timid in sharing his heart for your personal salvation. He also valued his family and working hard to provide for them. Whether working on his family farm or the family equipment business, he had no quit. Uncle Brett, you posted a, a beautiful, beautifully crafted tribute earlier this week where it was shared in, that in Grandma's Bible, she had written a quote that originated from St. Augustine that said, we need to pray as if everything depends on him and work as if everything depends on us. Man, he lived it out, didn't he? My name is Ben Shuffle, and I'm Jonas's oldest grandson. Grandpa's legacy is rooted in his rock-solid character, his steadfast integrity, and his work ethic. And it's an absolute honor to be an ambassador to that legacy, and so into future generations. Although he leaves a huge void here for all that knew him, all of heaven rejoices as he stands in the presence of his Jesus. Love you, Grandpa. Sorry, just like Grandpa, my son fell asleep and was on me and I couldn't get up. <laughs> so they asked who could talk and most of the family said, we can't talk because we can't speak through our emotions and we are all very emotional. So I was doing good. Thanks a lot, Ben. <laughs> you probably know I'm a pastor's wife and so when they said who can talk, I thought I can do it. I speak lots of times. I can write an outline and I can power through it. <laughs> 
So I started thinking about, how could I talk about my grandpa? I could talk about him by the numbers. He was a loving and devoted husband to one wife of more than 71 beautiful years. He was a patient father to eight children, one of whom he's finally getting to know 60 some years after he first met her. He was a very playful grandfather to 13 grandchildren. And he was a very tender great grandfather to 20, 23 great girl grandchildren with two more any time. But I thought, no, no, that's not very exciting. Numbers are boring. What if I talked about grandpa by the hats he wore? So I thought, and they've already beat me to a lot of this, but I could tell you, you might not know. He was a truck driver for many years, driving loads of chickens into the city in the middle of the night. He was a butcher, he processed hogs, he was a dairy farmer. In general, he was a very hard worker. All of that, of course, before he finally settled in as the head honcho at Shuffle Equipment. And besides that, we all know he was so involved in the church that he dedicated his life to here. Still not very exciting. Let's talk about fun things. Who was Grandpa? Well, of course, we all know how much he loved music. He filled every quiet moment humming or singing with his beautiful baritone song, any random hymn that we will always think of him and grandma when we hear. Let's laugh. What about the inf most infamous nickname he had that came from an overambitious farmer who lost his arm in a car to a cartoon PTO shaft in a John Deere Day safety film? And this gotta go Joe couldn't stop to take the time, and there was a lot of resemblance there. It became gotta go Jonas. He also was a little ornery, and he insisted to us, to my sister and I, on a reunion trip to Oklahoma, that you could call a llama out of a field by standing at the edge of it and yelling, Here, lummy, lummy, lummy. They already talked about his repeating word ranking system. If it, something was a little bit fancy or fancy fancy. His very less than subtle cue to grandma that it's time to go with, well, hun. His masterful ability to fall asleep anywhere, usually in a chair, but surprisingly often flat on his back on the top of a picnic table in the middle of a crowd. You're never going to go to lunch. You're going to get a bite to eat. Still, let's keep going. Let's find something better. So I thought about what are his character qualities? Well, he was the hardest worker I've ever known. But opposite that, he was the most reverential observer of the Sabbath that I've ever known. He was godly. He was determined. He was covertly honorary. He was overall honorable. So what would Grandpa think about all this? I think he'd tell us to be done. Go get a bite and do some fellowship. He wouldn't be interested in this fuss. So in the end, I just want to tell you what I will miss. <coughs> See, I should have done this the most about my grandpa, which will be listening to him pray. Always with full sincerity and complete faith, whether it was before a meal or just because the family was gathered for whatever the occasion of the day was. It was always an evident pleasure for him to be talking to his Savior. His gratitude for who God is and what he had done for him was always clear. I don't remember a single prayer that didn't involve him thanking God for his perfect plan of salvation. In recent years, when he finally started slowing down, and he spent a lot of his time sitting in his living room. I'm told he would sit in his recliner every day and pray his way along the wall of grandchildren. That has always been such a huge blessing for me. He spent his whole life working hard to follow Jesus. And he and grandma built a beautiful legacy a heritage for who they desired more than anything, we continue to walk in faith and join them in glory with their Savior someday soon.
I've been asked to read Psalm 23, and I could read it straight from the Bible as it is. I could explain it one way or another. Uh, I could um, tell you the Lord is my shepherd and that's relationship, etc. But I was asked specifically to give the explanation that Philip Keller gave in his book titled, A Shepherd Looks at the Psalm 23rd, 23rd Psalm. So I'm going to give you that explanation this morning, this afternoon. The psalm is written from the perspective of a sheep, and it begins with a sheep talking to another sheep, bragging about his shepherd. So you have to understand that David, the sheep, is on one side of a fence, and there's another sheep from another fold on the other side of the fence, and they're talking through the fence. So David, the sheep, is bragging, and he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. At that the one sheep that was on the other side of the fence leaves. The shepherd now comes in, and the sheep is now talking to the shepherd. And you'll notice this through the different pronouns he's used. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. And at this point, the shepherd is no longer there. The sheep is now talking to himself, saying, Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. At this time, Savannah Shuffle is going to come and minister to us in music with Sheltered in the Arms of God.
heaven's portals Come home, my child It's the last mile you must try I'll fall asleep And wake in God's new heaven Sheltered safe shall harm me for I'm sheltered in the arms of God sheltered safe within the arms of God gather here today to remember the life of Jonas Creed Shuffle, there's oftentimes a lot of mixed emotions going on. On one hand, there's deep sadness, sadness because we lost this person that is so dear to us. But on the other hand, oftentimes there's such great joy and comfort in knowing that because of the relationship that Jonas had with Jesus that's already been described uh, here this afternoon, that he is already in the presence of his Savior, Jesus. Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, so we are always confident that knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And for the believer, there's no greater joy than being in the presence of the one who loves us like no one else can. So today, even though it's a day of sorrow, it's not a day of mourning. It's really a day of celebration for Jonas because uh, Jonas is now in this special place that he's longed for most of his life, longing for that day where he would meet Jesus. As already been described, Jonas was a hard worker. Someone described him earlier in the week as a pusher. Uh, he was always pushing to get, some, to get somewhere to get something done. He was a great provider for his family. He was dedicated to his family and to his work. He enjoyed, loved being with family and friends until, of course, as was described, he was ready to go. He was always on the move. Jonas enjoyed listening to gospel music specifically, especially the inspirations in the Gaithers. And if you were near him, oftentimes you could catch him singing along. He enjoyed working with his family on the farm and in the family business. But yet, as been described already, he was always on the go. But I think the most important defining feature about Jonas was that he had a deep relationship with Jesus. And that relationship that he knew with Jesus had some great promises that he held on to uh, that inspired his life and the way that he lived. John chapter 14 was one of the passages that Pastor Don read to him in the last few days of his life here on earth. This is what it says. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. And where I go, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus responded to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want to tell you, in those last uh, years specifically, uh, maybe even months, uh, I want to tell you that Jonas did not fear death. This passage talks, as Jesus is talking about death, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. And that's the way Jonas lived. He did not fear death. He looked forward to the time that he would leave this world. He was concerned about his family. 
but he was willing to leave this world for the promise that was to come of heaven. Why did Jonas not fear death? Because God removed that fear from him. You see, we're troubled when we view death as an end instead of a beginning. But for the Christian, heaven is a new beginning. It's a new way. It's taken the fear out of dying. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 says this, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So we don't need to fear death because Jesus, for the believer, has conquered death in the grave. So there needs to be no fear in our eternal future. Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18 says, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. The good news is that death had no hold on Jesus. And therefore, for the believer, including Jonas, death had no hold on him. Because Christ conquered death, there should be absolutely no fear for the Christian because we know that through Jesus, we too can conquer death. Jonas demonstrated that. He proclaimed that in so many different ways. The truth that Paul shares in Romans chapter 8 that I read with Jonas in those final days from verse 38 and 39 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jonas believed that, and he was not troubled at all because he knew this was sim simply a beginning in his life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, for, for we know that this earthly house, talking about the body that we're living in, this earthly house, this tent if, is destroyed, that we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, that is eternal in the heavens. So I want to tell you this afternoon that Jonas's life is not over. As a matter of fact, Jonas' life is now just beginning. He has shed the temporary for the eternal, the tarnished for the spotless, the passing for the everlasting. Yes, we understand that our earthly bodies, they die, uh, they will decay in this world, but our heavenly bodies, our spirits, will endure for all of eternity. I, I love how the Bible puts this into perspective from 2 Peter verses, or chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. It says, but beloved, do not fear for this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as yet one day. So let me encourage you to focus on that same promise that Jonas focused on, uh, that God would be there, that to not fear uh, death, to not let your hearts be troubled. But he also believed that Jesus was preparing a place for him. This verse, in, in this verse that we read, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. It's a new home. It's a mansion prepared with beauty and splendor. And when I, I want to tell you that that place that God was preparing for Jonas, uh, the work on Jonas's room was finished on Monday, April 8th. It was totally complete. And as the songwriter says that Jonas heard many times, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. Jonas's home is complete and it's paved in gold. This is what he has prepared for us from Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. It says, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. This place that he's prepared, as scripture says, will be a place where there's no more sorrow, there's no more crying. Heaven is a place where the hurts of this world and the disappointments of this world, they no longer have a sting. Where the frustrations of life are replaced with unspeakable joys. Where the pains of this life are not permitted any longer. And the failures of this life, they control us no more. This is a place where there's no more pain. I often will say to families, heaven is a place that has no handicapped parking places. There's no pharmacies or prescriptions to fill. Heaven doesn't have hospitals or nursing homes or rehabilitation centers. And the days of aches and pains for our loved one, Jonas, they've ceased. He is totally, absolutely restored. And this place is a place of great beauty. This is what's been prepared. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 18. Listen to the description that we see of heaven. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was as of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. 
but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need for the sun or for the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is, is, the, is the light, and the gate shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no more night there, but there shall be no means, anything that enters it that defiles, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Continuing to the next chapter, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. Verse 4 says, They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no more night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever and ever. This is a place that's being prepared for Jonas, a place far better than anything in this world, better than anything we could imagine. He's at home now experiencing that beauty and that comprehension. But Jonas also believed that personally someone would be there to greet him, that he would see not only those who loved him that he experienced in this world, those who have gone on before with a relationship with Jesus, but also Jesus himself. Jonas loved all kinds of people. His wife of nearly 72 years was a great example uh, for his family and others to love someone through thick and thin through all of those years. He loved his family. He enjoyed spending time with them, and he enjoyed people most of the time. Uh, he, he, he was, whether uh, he was, knew someone from a local farmer uh, or a breakfast buddy at King's or a customer from the store or someone from church, it seemed like Jonas knew at least half of Somerset County or more. So many times when we think of people that, that, that know so many people, we think, boy, there's a line in heaven, don't we? Uh, there's this line of the first and the second and the third and all of these people that are standing in line ready to greet him as he walked into heaven. Perhaps his parents, uh, maybe uh, his loving wife, Ruth, maybe children or siblings or a close friend. I think that's a great thought to have this view of this line and who's in the front. But I want to tell you, I believe there's someone right up front of that line. Uh, when we as a believer arrive in heaven, there's someone that's in the front of the line ready to embrace us. And that one is Jesus himself. And the beautiful thing that we celebrate today is that Jonas now stands in the presence of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to imagine the moment that Jonas took his last breath here on earth, his first breath in heaven, and he opened up his eyes, and he saw the Lord Jesus standing there, right there to welcome him in. The first image that he saw was Jesus himself. He was there with his arms wide open to receive him into this great mansion that he has prepared for his children. And I want to tell you, in that moment, he experienced something that we'll never understand this side of heaven. A love that forgives every failure we ever had in life. A, a love that mends every hurt that he ever knew. A love that understands every feeling that he ever had. An unconditional love that completely satisfied the full longing of his soul. But there was one more promise that Jonas held on to. And that was there was only, way, there was only one way to get to heaven. There's only one way to make your reservation, and that's through Jesus Christ. Thomas, as Jesus was talking to Thomas, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We know that Jonas was a believer in Jesus. He understood that without a relationship with Jesus, there was absolutely no hope of heaven. Jonas knew that truth, and he believed it with all of his heart. And he lived out that faith. As mentioned earlier, Jonas was this doer, he was this pusher, and that was lived out not only in his work life, but also in his service life to God as well. Through those 56 years that Jonas was a member of this church, he served as an elder, uh, he served on the governing board, he served as a Sunday school teacher, he served as building chairman when this current building that we're sitting in right now was built. He knew all of the ins and outs of this building. I remember one day, I was setting chairs up here in the front, and chairs fit better on this side than on this side. And I thought, that's kind of strange. Am I setting these up weird? So I counted the brick. And I discovered there's one extra brick on this side than there is on this side. So I thought, the only person that will know why is Jonas. So I tracked Jonas down and I said, Jonas, you got to tell me, why is there one extra brick on this side than on this side? And Jonas simply got a grin on his face. 
and he said one word, volunteers. <laughs> Wasn't planned that way. Volunteers did it, but Jonas knew. <laughs> Jonas was introduced to Jesus at a very young age, but part of that spiritual growth, as been described already, was his daily devotional. Every morning, reading usually the daily bread and his Bible there together. Jonas believed in the truth of God's word. He realized that salvation was not about being a good person. It wasn't about even serving in his church. He discovered that uh, salvation was about a relationship with Jesus. One of his favorite verses, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. He understood that, and he understood that Jesus came to take away the sins of the world, which also included his sins. And he believed in the greatest promise that was given to all, found in John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Jonas was absolutely sure of that promise. And because of that relationship with Jesus, he is in this place of ultimate beauty, ultimate peace, experiencing a love that we cannot even imagine. If Jonas were here to speak to you today, I know that he would say, I want to make sure that you know those same promises as well. So there might be some that are here uh, this afternoon and that have never really given thought to your eternal future, that if today would be your last day on this world, where would you go and where would you spend eternity? So to honor Jonas... Let me just take a moment to share with you some of the scriptures that explain that promise. The first one we already heard, that Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Friends, there's no other way to heaven. It's only through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to do with religion, being Baptist or Catholic or Lutheran or Methodist or Presbyterian or Alliance or anything else. It doesn't have to do with being a good person. And despite what some people think, no one can pray you into this place. 1 John chapter 5, verses 12 and 13 says, He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you, that, that you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Friends, we can know, we can hold on to that promise, because that's what Scripture says. You can't get much clearer than that, that it tells you that you can know where you will spend eternity, in heaven or in hell. Jonas knew that promise. He held on to that because he knew that he had a deep relationship with Jesus. The second thing we see is that Jesus paid the price uh, to be saved. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So you say, okay, what's that mean? What do I need to do? Three things. First, we must realize that sin separates us from God. Scripture, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whether it's a little white lie, this little thing over here, or a lifestyle that we know is not pleasing to God, Scripture is very clear, all have sinned. Once we understand that, we must ask God to forgive us for living that way. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He takes the righteousness of Jesus, his death on the cross, and covers all of our sinfulness. And therefore, our broken relationship is now restored. And you say, okay, I get that, I understand that, but what do I do? The last thing is we just simply need to ask him to come and be our personal savior. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not some, not a select few, but it says, for whoever for whoever comes to that realization that I'm a sinner, that Jesus covered my sins, he will forgive me. And now I call out to him for whoever does that. I call out on the name of the Lord, uh, then I will be saved. You pray with me. Father, we thank you for that truth that Jonas had that guided his life, that gave him the strength to live so boldly for you in this world. The truth that he knew that he had this deep relationship with Jesus. And because of that relationship, he knew 
He didn't need to fear death. He knew that you were preparing a place. He knew that he would meet his Jesus, and he knew. That's why he proclaimed to so many other people that there was only one way to heaven. Thank you for that promise. Thank you that we know that because of that promise, uh, he is now in your presence. Maybe you're here this afternoon and you're saying, well, I'm not sure where I will spend eternity. I want to guide you in a simple prayer. Uh, something, it's not magic power in the words, but it's your heart expression to him. You say something like this, God, I recognize that you are holy. And I recognize that I'm a sinner. And because you are holy and I'm a sinner, our relationship is now broken. But I believe that you sent your son Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. That perfect life now covers my imperfect life. And as a result of his shed blood, my sins can be forgiven. And I, have a restored, I can have a restored relationship with you. So God, this, today, the only way that I know how, I reach out and I claim you as Savior. I claim you as Lord of my life. Help me to understand what that means. Help me to live my life out for you. Or maybe you're here this afternoon and you've said, hey, I, 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 I did that already. I, I've, I've done that. But maybe your life is not living proof of that. Maybe it's not demonstrating uh, the love that you have for Jesus. Maybe, as some would say, maybe you even walked away from that faith. And I want to tell you that it's never, ever too late to return. And when you come back, you cry in the same way, Lord, here I am broken and apart from you, and I'm coming back. I want to restore that relationship. Help me to live boldly for you. Help me know that one day, that we will gather and there will be beauty and power and strength. Lord, thank you for these truths. Thank you for Jonas. Thank you for the time that you shared his life with us and the impact that he had in so many ways. May you be honor, honored in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close our service, uh, words will again be on the screens behind me. Uh, let's sing together what a day that will be.
do not know the assurance of that, and you want to speak to someone about your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, because you don't have those promises that Jonas had and based his whole entire life on, based upon the truth of the Word of God. Uh, we'll be glad to talk to you if you want us, if you let us know, because we would love to know that everyone is ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ, because we don't know when our last breath will be taken here and our next breath will be in eternity. And before I dismiss in prayer, I'm just going to say we have a meal prepared. And for those who are staying for the meal, if you, when you go out to the sanctuary doors, if you go out and follow and come along this outside of this wall here, there's restrooms on the other side, men's and, and ladies. And you go up to the, the double door, which is back here, go to the left, and it'll put you right into the fellowship hall. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to ask the blessing here because as soon as you get there, instead of sitting down and et cetera, uh, you can start and get right in line. The ladies are already prepared so that you can have uh, the meal and then you can be visiting and communing and, and having fellowship one with the other. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love for us. You loved us so much that you willingly sent your only begotten son into this world to become a man, fully God, fully man, and become sin for us. And you who knew no sin became sin, for we who knew no nothing about righteousness could become the righteousness of God through Christ. And so Father, we ask that the message we've heard will be impressed upon our mind and upon our heart and that if there's any that does not know Jesus Christ, that they would call upon you. We thank you for each one that is here. Thank you for each one that has come to support uh, the family in this time of bereavement. Uh, we thank you for the time of fellowship and the food. Thank you for the food that's been provided. We're asking, Father, for your blessing on the food. We ask that your name would be honored and glorified in all the conversations around the table. In Jesus' name, amen.